Part 7 Supersession Try to wear the shoes which you had when you were two, four, or six years old. You may have a similar problem if you try, say, to follow a book of prescriptions written in Syriac. If there is no supersession, there is no fresh growth. If we are not to operate in the mode of today, we shall, at best, reproduce effects designed for people of yesterday. The Candle This candle burns for a hundred hours, said the merchant to the blind man. I don't know about the burning, but I do know about the usefulness to me, said the blind man. Unworthy Friend He is generous with what you have, and is economical with anything of his own. These twin practices have told you that he is unworthy. Yet he can still convince you otherwise, because people believe mere words readily and are eager for attention. They welcome sham actions. The word, therefore, is speaking louder than the action. The Difference Between Saying and Doing Quite a common observation is, it takes all sorts to make a world. This may well be true, but if it is, where are they all? Self-satisfaction If self-satisfaction follows an achievement, it was no achievement at all compared to what it could have been. Depression after supposed failure means that the attempt was wrongly structured. No real attempt took place, however much it may seem that there was one. Behind the Machine Man is generally a few paces behind his own inventions. There are still many people who are revered as figures of authority, merely because they can do such things as machines can do more easily. A common example is the awe which people show when faced with someone who has only a good memory or associative capacity, often stuffed with irrelevant facts. This recalls the refrain, man is not a machine, frequently used by people whose work and actions tend more and more to convert men into machines. It is no accident that those cultures which most strongly and often affirm the value and individuality of man are the ones which do most towards automatizing him. Good and Bad There is no philosophical teacher nor system which will tell you to do other than good. You will probably be advised to strive against what is bad. This is the first lesson, of course but one should want to go beyond. The succeeding lessons are not taught by inflexible principle, nor by ordinary cultivation, nor by standardized exercises. The succeeding lessons are all on what is good and what is bad in the successive stages of a person's life, in the different epochs of a culture, in the various expressions of a teaching. You can only learn this from the exponents of a contemporary school, rooted in the most ancient past, expressing this in institutions designed to be effective. These are not made for attraction value, nor for the robustness of the vehicle. Your Problem I have heard all that you have to say to me on your problems. You ask me what to do about them. It is my view that your real problem is that you are a member of the human race. Face that one first. Books and Donkeys Anyone can see that an ass laden with books remains a donkey. A human being, laden with the undigested results of a tussle with thoughts and books, however, still passes for wise. Specificity The analysis of a situation is one thing. The prescription of the remedy, when indicated, is another. Diagnostic capacity does not prove therapeutic ability. In dealing with human conditions, the procedure almost always has to be specific, not generalised. MCO 
MCO stands for Mutual Comfort Operation. One cannot understand the complex advantages and otherwise of human relations without knowing the quantity and quality of mutual comfort inherent in any social contact. History Right time, right place, right people equals success. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong people equals most of the real human story. The wise and ignorant. When the ignorant have become numerous or powerful enough, they have been referred to by a special name. This name is the wise. Better try something than nothing at all. This appalling statement holds good only in the most restricted fields. A little radioactivity may be worse than none at all. Try to cross a desert 30 days' journey in extent with only 10 days' water rations, and then see whether the assumption given above fits your case. Proclaiming, however optimistically, that the way to death is a way to life does not alter the outcome if it is attempted with no further knowledge than that. To find a way of life Primitively damaging supposition underlies most people's thinking about higher knowledge. As a result, they ask the wrong questions about it. They may assume that inner studies are a way of life. They are, in fact, a means which produces the right way of life for each individual. If you apply psychological techniques to your everyday life, you may make progress. But they must be those which belong to the time. And, if they are not suitable, you will probably have on balance lost a great deal. Many people are better served by self-development, which itself aims at transforming their outer life. But this is not a higher study. Intellectual Exercise I was invited one day to the delightful home of a celebrated savant. Also present were a number of his and his wife's friends, all accustomed to the intensive study of contemporary as well as traditional human thought. After dinner, when we gathered in the drawing room, the atmosphere having been prepared by three hours of stimulating intellectual exercise, the great man cleared his throat, pulled up his chair and addressed me. I could see by the expectancy on every face that this was the major turn of the evening. I have read such and such a book of yours, he said, and I need not conceal from you that I regard it as being not at all what it purports to be, deficient in material and argument, not justified in its title by its content. I am indeed obliged that you should have taken so much trouble with my poor work, I said. I would very much like to hear what you have to say for yourself, said the academic. I told him that it was customary in the assemblies of scholars, so far as I was informed about them, to have detailed arguments before being able to attempt to defend oneself, much less to try to refute them. Would he condescend to tell me in detail what he did not like in my work? He would, and did, at considerable length. He showed great familiarity with my subject, cited book after book to give other people's points of view, and generally gave a display of virtuosity which certainly impressed the rest of the company. All this took about an hour and a half, during which time I, together with the others present, remained silent. When he had finished, I said to him, You have certainly covered that field in an astonishingly impressive manner. Your delineation of my materials and the arguments against them are an experience. I wish that I could do equal justice to my own arguments in defending them, but I think that I lack your academic expertise. I then asked him whether, if he were in my place, he could marshal as impressive an argument from my own part. When he said that he could, I simply asked him whether he could do us all the honour of hearing it. The result was that in just under another hour, so carried away was he by his eloquence and the joy of exercising his intellect, he succeeded in demolishing point by point his own case against my book. 
But the really strange thing was that the rest of the guests, accustomed to worship at the temple of this undoubtedly impressive man, congratulated him on his remarkable mind, not one of them seeming to notice that he had done my job for me, and had refuted himself and all his cited authorities in the process. I only hope that I am wrong in suspecting that he would have gained an equal amount of adulation had he been reciting, for memory of course, the London Telephone Directory. Reactions Psychologists have noted, quite rightly, that when people are guilty about something, they may react strongly against it, thinking that their behaviour is rooted in other reasons. We all know, too, that an energetic reaction may have nothing to do with the subject apparently being reacted about. We should watch these things. But there is another kind of reaction, too. People who are accustomed to being stimulated by coarse or tense impacts feel odd when approached by an often more valuable but generally more sensitive impact. They tend to avoid contact with this by the simple pretext of calling it banal or uninteresting. A sense of anticlimax is to be watched. It may frequently be caused by the desirable disappointment of an undesirable expectation. You cannot be certain to be able to pin down the expectation which was incorrect, or even the assumptions which make you react in this manner. But you can observe yourself reacting in this way. This is an indispensable prerequisite for training to become really sensitive to essential impressions. It is called watching. Caterpillar If you could say to a caterpillar, You were an egg and you will become a butterfly, he would reply, Foul beast! Or else, You are imagining things, or seek to unhinge me. Or again, I want to be one now, this instant. Or he might say, Who are you to tell me such things? Or, yet again, Yes, show me, while I crawl up this tree. Maneuvering Many individual problems relating to perplexity and mutual misunderstanding would be solved if people could only appreciate that they tend to try to manipulate one another far more often than is suspected. I have carried out hundreds of experiments in which I and my associates have, instead of taking people's actions and words at face value, assumed that people are trying to score a point, or to assuage anxiety, or to manipulate. This is the kind of experiment which almost anyone can verify. By alternately seeming to agree, to yield, to fall in with someone's suggestions or to be unconvinced, you can quite easily see this hidden pattern at work. There are two great values in such a study. First, it helps you to dissociate your emotions from what is in fact a ritual situation. Second, it shows you what many people are really doing when they are at work or play despite their own overt beliefs about their activities. Pen Names From time to time I have had occasion to tell people that I write under names other than my own, pen names. Can you believe that, in at least nine instances out of ten, after hearing this the person has said, Indeed, and what are your pen names? This is a good illustration of the almost complete automatism of much thinking. If people write under pseudonyms, it is surely because they do not want their real name to be known as attached to that writing. Why then would such a person be thought likely to tell anyone else what that pen name was? This is all the more remarkable because the people reacting in this way were almost always strangers, comparatively, people who would be supposed less likely than close friends to receive such confidences. The First and Last Battles Not knowing when one is beaten is more generally only a pretty conceit than a rule of life. There is a man better than the one who does not know when he is beaten. This is the man who does not have to know, because he wins. On the same theme, some people seek to make a virtue out of losing every battle but the last. I would, however, 
recommend them to win the first in such a manner that it is also the last battle. In higher studies, it is the people who have lost preliminary battles who are our greatest problems, for they may still be in the field, but have never escaped unscathed, and are generally in need of rehabilitation rather than instruction.